Welcome back. This is the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host, Nick Filato. It's mailbag part two today. Got a lot of questions. We may even have to hit a mailbag part three. We'll see where this goes. Love the mailbag. Love the questions. One of my favorite pods we get to do. So without further ado, let's dive right into this thing. Bias let's do giant. it. Yeah. Bias Giant fan asks. I love talking about the Giants, but I have no idea how to start doing that as a profession. Writing, reporting, podcasts, even just being on the Giants staff. Any advice you guys have? I know it's a vague question, but any help on where or what I could do to start would be awesome. Thank you, guys. I'm a huge fan. I think since you reached out to us on Twitter, you have a platform right there, right? So you can use that platform to engage with others, maybe get into those Twitter spaces, talk with people there, get your name out there, just be authentic to yourself. And then... Unfortunately, a lot of the ways this kind of ends up materializing is you got to latch on somewhere and start writing. And I hate to like suggest this, but like I wrote for free for quite a while. And then I started kind of making a name for myself. And that's how I ended up kind of landing gigs where, where I'm at now. So that's kind of what, what I would say is just kind of use your platform on Twitter to put yourself out there and try to meet people because networking and just kind of being personable and being yourself, being authentic, some of the more important traits to, to really any career, not just this one. Yeah. I think that's really good advice. My advice is a few things. One, you most importantly have to have a passion for this. If you don't have a passion for this, you're going to get lapped by somebody else who does have a passion for this. And that passion has to show in your work and in your content creation, like Nick, I did this for free for a long time. I was working multiple jobs. At first, I was working a completely different job full time while writing a blog and getting my start there. Then I got a little bit of a break. I was working for Fox Sports covering the NFC South for them, but it wasn't much money. It was very little money, and but it was my first actual money making uh, you know, in this industry. And at the same time, I was working as a bar back in New York City to try to just make ends meet and pay the bills. And it was a tough. I mean, it was a grind. I was working during the day doing the Fox Sports stuff. And then at night, I would literally go to the bar and I'd work there until like 2, 3 a.m. before we, you know, after we closed down shop and everything. So it's going to be tough at first. It's going to be a grind, but you have to have the passion for it. And if you have the passion for it, you'll be willing to put that grind in. But you have to start by using your platform to get your name out there. Like Nick said, these new Twitter spaces are a great example of how to do it. There's also chats with a lot of diehard Giants fans, but more importantly, it's going to be up to you. Do you have takes that people want to listen to? Do you have nuanced, interesting things to add to the discussion? Or, you know, are you saying, are you, are, and if that's the case, you're going to shine. Eventually you're going to come through and it's going to shine through. So if you have the passion for it, if you have interesting takes and if you put in the work, there are other ways to do it. Look like there are ways to, to break out by doing film analysis. There are ways to bring out, break out by doing salary cap analysis, draft analysis for the Giants roster, all these different things relating to the Giants. You just have to find your niche and your, and what, what you have to say that people are interested in hearing. That's what it comes down to. But the third thing I would add outside of the passion for it and um, obviously adding unique and interesting analysis would be to engage, to engage with you, with everyone who wants to engage with you at any time or people you don't even engage with. This is how I really have established myself, I believe, by engaging. It started by me engaging with Chris Wessling years ago when he worked at Roto World. And that got me my first gig, a social media, you know, running the Twitter account for Roto World, which sprung everything into action for me. And since then, it's not lost on me that his decision to take a chance on me and to engage with me that day changed my whole career. And I've made that decision with a lot of people, basically everyone who's engaged with me on Twitter. There are some of you not hopefully listening to this podcast, but I, who I've had to mute because you're just relentless. And unfortunately <laughs> not, it's, it's not, I don't think it's fair. The things you have to say, and it's very rare. I, there are people who disagree with me that have never been muted and i never will mute. Cause I love to get into the good engaging disagreement conversations, the ones that are crazy and not based in reality. And that's when it starts to kind of fall off for me. And this is going on a tangent here, but the point is engage with the people who are engaging with you most importantly, and engage with people who aren't engaging with you, with you that are maybe already established in this industry, because that's a good way to get your name out there. And then they may, they may read something that, that you have to say about what they had to say and be like, Oh, that's a good point. That's interesting. This you know, this biased giants, I don't know your name, but this, let's just call you Mark or whatever for now. Mark has something <laughs> interesting to say here. Let's hear more from Mark. So those are the three pillars for me. One, have the passion for it Two, be a self-starter and get your takes out there into the sphere. 
And then three, engage, 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 engage. Melly D asks, what's your go-to spot in New York City for classical Napoletan and artisanal chicken parm and eggplant parm? And then we'll get into our Giants-related question. This is directed at you, Dan. Yeah, of course, <laughs> you don't need any of this food, Nick. Um, <laughs> so I think it's a go-to spot for pizza. We he was using emoji that didn't transfer over into our doc here. So pizza for me. Lately, I've been on the Lit Industry kick. So Lit Industry is a place in Brooklyn. Uh, I think uh, Action Bronson made it fame, made it a little famous a little while ago. I think it's basically as good as Defara's, which is my number one place. I I'm going to say it's a little less. It's Defara's is my number one place. That's in Brooklyn. Um, so Defara's pizza, my favorite, a little bit more traditional style. But the Lit Industry, I think, is as good as... Um, What's the one in, in Brooklyn by Prospect Park that everybody loves? Damn, I'm blanking on this name. I don't know why. Um, Lucali's. I think Lindustry is as good as Lucali's, which some people think is the best. So Lindustry, I would say. But as far as the classic slice, I think Joe's, man. Joe's classic New York slice in is just so good. When I used to live in the city, so many late nights I would end at Joe's and lines out the door. And just phenomenal classic New York slice. So Joe's for the classic New York slice. John's on Bleecker is amazing as well. The industry, though, is my new one that I'm on. As far as like chicken parm, eggplant parm, I don't really do. I don't really, honestly, I don't really go out for much for Italian food because I can cook Italian food and I don't cook it that well. But I've had some good recipes passed down through the day. Shout out Mike Collins, who does not listen to this podcast, but his grandma meatball, uh, meatball and sauce recipe i've been using that thing since college and i've been crushing it since then it is i've perfected it in my mind and so and even chicken parm like my mom makes a great chicken parm she's a jewish lady right who grew up in scotch in westfield new jersey like she figured out how to make chicken parm really good so i don't know i don't really like going out to spend to, to pay for chicken parm because that's something i can make at home and i think i can make it pretty well so i don't have a spot for there unfortunately and i'm sure somebody will come in and be like oh my god and i'll say this uh pasta shop in denville had a really good chicken parm it was cr super crisp like super pounded chicken for me it's all about do you pound that chicken crisp and is it crispy and if it's not it's like the fatty chicken breast that's not a good chicken parm to me and same goes for eggplant make it crispy um and i'm not, by the way i'm not a huge eggplant fan just got to say that not not a big eggplant farm fan just i don't love eggplant oh okay do you see uh, us winning more divisional games next season which free agent will we sign who will have the biggest impact more divisional games next season so i think there's a good chance the cowboys could be on the downswing a bit just based on their cap situation the zeke situation god that's a disaster of a contract the fact that they don't really have in my opinion anything explosive at the skill skill position outside of cd lamb um offensive line it is kind of what they have or what they're going to draft at this point tyron smith is older breaking down i think he's at some point zach martin is going to get into that age group as well and i as much as i love my guy biata she's not the best center so i think that, that they could steal one from the cowboys maybe split there and in and i also think they could potentially sweep the the washington commanders depending on where they go at quarterback if they stick with howell who ultimately I think might actually give them a better chance than than Heineke or Wentz did this year. So that actually could be a, a bad thing for the Giants. But it's possible to sweep those and to win one of the Cowboys games. So I will say they will win more divisional games next season. And free they agent better signing, win more divisional games. They only won one this yeah, year. If they don't win right. more divisional games next year, they're not making the playoffs. You're not playing right. the AFC South every single season. So they have well, to. They're win playing the AFC East next season, which is a rough slate, especially if the Jets yeah. upgrade at quarterback. If if Tua comes back, the Bills and the Patriots with a real offensive coordinator, that's going to be a tougher slate. You're right. Uh, so they're going to have to. You're right about that. Biggest free agent signing uh, who have the biggest impact. Um, we don't know the I'll free go, agents yet. So do you? Yeah, I'll go David Long, though, as the early, early call. I really like. Okay, yeah. Long. I, don't I think whoever. More, but yeah, whoever they sign at linebacker, at linebacker. will have <laughs> yeah. the impact because yes. it's difficult to not. To we not have a question. Have a, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Keith Levin asks, who is your favorite supporting character on the wire? Can't say McNulty, Bunk, Omar, or Stinger. A lot of non-Giants questions. I like this. But I don't oh, man, I can't contribute at all here because I don't know what the hell the wire is. I know that's the only <laughs> you, you need to watch the wire so you can contribute on this one. I think I just heard you call him Stinger, which I didn't love because it's Stringer. Uh, but oh. okay. Is that what they have written down? Yeah, yeah no, he, written down. he was right. He was right. Yeah. You've never watched the show, so I don't blame you. I'll I'll start by saying this. Yes, I was never a McNulty fan. I didn't like McNulty, not one of my guys. So I wouldn't have said him anyway, even if he didn't allow me to. Omar, I, I'm sorry, Stringer. First time I watched The Wire, I was Team Stringer. Second time I watched The Wire, I was Team Avon. From every point on, I was Team Avon. The more you watch that show, you the more you see the mistakes Stringer made 
throughout his tenure. And really, in my opinion, Stringer's the reason I don't want to do spoilers. Yeah, see, actually. this is the thing. I, don't, I haven't seen it yet. Is I might actually just mute you and I'll just like see your mouth <laughs> moving. And when it stops, I'll come back in. I'm going to do that, actually. Yeah, just turn your sound off on your computer, maybe. Um, you're then you're gonna flash, me, flash me like this whenever you want me back in. No, I won't be doing any more spoilers. I won't. I won't. Okay. So I'm just going to do this non-spoiler free. This is actually an easy question for me, Keith, because my favorite overall character is a supporting character. So it's pretty easy for me. And that character is Bodhi. Bodhi, this is not a spoiler, but the final scene with, I don't even say the final scene, a scene <laughs> at toward the end of the show with McNulty and Bodhi in the park is one of the best scenes in the wire history. I think it kind of caps encapsulates why Bodhi's my favorite character through and through he was a soldier from start to the end and he was very transparent one of the very few transparent people's uh, uh characters on that show he is who he says he was he is who he always was and he stuck true to who he was throughout the show so Bodhi is my favorite supporting character and favorite overall character I muted you throughout most of that so I only caught the I tail end so it's gonna be fun when I watch the show and then just remember what you said on yeah. the tail end to see if it's consistent all right we have James Spadafara asks, do you see the Eagles having the same level of success next season? Looking at their cap situation and free agents for 2023, I see it hard for them to have similar success with their almost super team-like roster they have this year. I think they will have a same, the same level of success next year. Maybe a little bit of a drop-off, but there's some things that we have to understand. Howie Roseman is a genius with the salary cap, and he's going to keep pushing back cap. He's going to keep pushing, putting on these void contracts. They're going to lose a few players here and there, right? Like They might end up losing TJ Edwards, a player I'd love the Giants to sign. They might end up losing guys like that, but they still have their core defensive line. They just signed Hassan Redick. He's going nowhere. They have their offensive line in place. None of those guys are going anywhere. Jalen Hurts is still on that rookie deal. Maybe they have to re-sign him, but even if they do, they'll probably have a small cap hit in year one and backload that thing because that's what Roseman does. So I don't really, A.J. Brown's under contract, Devontae Smith rookie deal, Dallas Goddard's already signed. So really the core of the core, they, they might have a drop-off, right? Like if T.J. Edwards leaves and then they're like stuck at linebacker and they're in a giant type situation, we might see a situation where we go into next year, we're in week 15 and we're like, Man, that Eagles run defense is terrible. But then again, Jordan Davis is going to return to that run defense next year and potentially be a much better player than he was this year, certainly healthier. So I don't know, man. I don't think there's going to be much of a drop off there. I think there'll be a little bit of a drop off. Here's a free agents. Fletcher Cox, Robert Quinn, Brandon Graham, Javon Hargrave, Jason Kelsey, James Bradbury, Isaac Ciamalu, Andre Dillard, Kaiser White, TJ Edwards, Dominican Sue, Limbill Joseph, Boston Scott. Thankfully, hopefully he is not retained. Zach Pascal, Miles Sanders. Chauncey Gardner Johnson, and then a couple other guys, Marcus Epps, who's their starting safety too. That is a lot, right? They're not going to retain yeah. all of those guys. Now you're right. Howie Roseman is a genius. I look at the Eagles and outside of Jalen Hurts' injury later in the season, like what adversity did they really face in terms of injuries? Yeah, that's a good question. They've been insanely healthy this year, really. I mean, Jordan Davis hurt their run defense for a little while, him being out, but. And they also have so much depth, which is a testament to Howie Roseman yeah. and the way that, that, that roster was constructed, but I don't know, man. I think I still think they'll make the playoffs. They'll likely win the division, even though we're so far out. It's a little bit hard to make that declaration now, but I don't know if right. they're just going to have as much uh, fortune. And I'm not saying that they're, you know, they're not talented or anything like that. It's just sometimes, you know, you just get really injured. You get hit with the injury bug. And it just seems like they really weren't this year other than Lane True. Johnson and Jalen Hurts at the end of the year. Yeah, that's fair. I, co I completely agree with that. Growing up, AJ Austin asks, what was your favorite album that you listened to on cassette? AJ, I don't think I ever listened to an album on, on cassette. Did you, Dan? I listened on Walkman, which I guess was was the CD player, though. But let's just say from yeah. a CD. Oh, from a CD? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, you go first. When I was growing up, man, I didn't really listen to anything that I listen to now, AJ. Like, burn I didn't have CDs. good music. What did you say? I used to burn yeah, I had CDs. tons of burn CDs. Yeah. But like... The music I listened to then was a combination of two things. I grew up listening to either like the screamo pop punk type stuff, like, you know, like the um, the used bands like that. My Chemical Romance, stuff like that. Yeah, stuff like that. Or Eminem and, and, and early rap. Like I, for me, my favorite album I listened to was was the uh, Marshall Mathers LP, which I just listen to over and over and over again to this day i don't really understand why my parents let me buy and listen to that but i guess they didn't have much of a choice and i was probably pushing for it hard or something when i'm like a 12 13 year old 14 year old kid listening to marshall mathers lp and slim shady lp when kim when the song kim comes out i'm like what the hell what kind of parents will let their kid listen to this kind of crap but obviously it didn't impact i mean millions of kids listen to it and they're fine hopefully <laughs> i mean I, I i turned out okay i guess but um but yeah so 
I would say it's Marshy, yeah, I guess. Marshall Mathers LP would be the one for me, or Slim Shady LP, one of the two for me. Yeah, I, I guess I'd have to just go with the Red Hot Chili Peppers album, maybe like Californication or By the Way. But mm. I listen to so many different types of music. I don't really have like one set of music that I'm into. Like I was listening to a lot of like even like rap back then. You know, I would buy like Ja Rule's album or something like that, or Eminem's albums. And I, I don't really necessarily have one album. I was mainly like a burn CD guy and then just kind of go with it and then just listen yeah. to some of the stuff my older brother listened to. AJ Austin also asked, who's the one player, prospect or pro, that you two had opposite evals on or disagreed on the most? Ooh. I'm trying to think. I got to think about this one. We've been doing this for a couple of years now. So it would be prospect or pro. Probably would be a prospect, right? I feel like we haven't had too many disagreements on the Giants players. I mean, there's things we've disagreed on. Like, I, I think, for example, on both sides of it, I, what I thought, um, who's the guy who busted from the Raiders? Uh, Leatherwood. I liked Leatherwood a little bit more. You were way out on Leatherwood. Alex I was, Leatherwood, yeah. yeah, I was completely out on resigning Logan Ryan. I think you were in on Ryan at the time. Yeah. So we've had like those like types of things, like smaller things like that, but none I'm trying to think if there's any like major opposite eval we've had. That's like way bigger than that. Um, it's kind of difficult too because we didn't really ever scout quarterbacks throughout the time of yeah, doing this. Because right. the Giants had always had a quarterback, sure. and those I feel like are the most the easiest to know if they busted. Oh yeah, or not because like there are guys who who like say like Sam Hubbard for instance. Like he ended up going I think in the third round. I had a first round grade out. I freaking loved Sam Hubbard. He was so when he good. Came out of the yeah. Dude, he he ran like an insane three cone, like almost better than most of the wide receivers in that draft class. And when you watched him at Ohio State, he was so quick on the twists. They yep. would just run four man pressures, and Sam Hubbard would come through the A gap almost every single time because his footwork was so precise. So I love that. But like, he's also in a place right now who runs a lot of even front, and they utilize his yeah. skill set correctly. If he went to another team that didn't necessarily use that type of skill set as True. much as or as well as they do, he might have busted. You know, he might not have had that opportunity, especially as a day two pick. So I just feel like with the quarterback position, all spotlights are on you. Like we could look at Zach Wilson right now and be like, yeah, that dude's a freaking bust. Right. But right. you can look at other other quarter or other players who who were drafted, say, in, in day two. And they just went to a team and a coaching staff that was fired after a year. And they just kind of toil away. And then, like you said on the last podcast, Dan, another team comes in like, I like this guy's skill set. They sign him to a deal that's pretty low. And the next thing you know, the guy is making huge yeah. plays on like Sunday night football. So I just right. feel like because we haven't done the quarterback position, we haven't necessarily disagreed as much because that's like one position where you really know if somebody actually truly was a huge bust. Yeah, I was trying to rack my brain. I don't know if we've had too many. I just I think through the prospects we've done, I, don't, I can't remember anyone we've completely seen differently so far. Just something to think about as we go forward, though, for sure. Good question anyway, AJ. Michael Ziesman asks, I think Daniel Jones is back on a multi-year deal in the low to mid-30s. But I'm getting the increasing feeling that we may let Saquon Barkley walk based on the price tag. That said, assuming we don't end up with a long-term deal, do you want Saquon Barkley on the tag or do you want to let him walk and start over? We've kind of talked about this a lot. I would love Saquon Barkley on the tag. I don't think he's going to play on the tag. I don't know if the Giants would even opt to tag him. I think it's either they're going to let him walk or they're they're going to resign him. I think Joe Shane probably has a number. And if Saquon Barkley thinks he's worth more, then he's more than likely going to walk. I think John Marin probably wants him back, ideally, but I don't think he's going to meddle to the point where he's going to get into Joe Shane's affairs. So I just don't really believe he's going to play on the tag. I think there's a number. It's probably around 12, 13-ish, probably around that. And if Saquon thinks he's worth more, then maybe he's going to be gone. Yeah, it's an interesting question because like in, in the totality of it all, you would think that like the teams have more power. Like they should be able to just franchise tag him and be like, you're either going to play on this tag or if you're going to give us enough problems in the locker room, we can at least trade you for like a fourth, fifth round pick because you can tag and trade players. But I just think the way the Giants operate their business, that's not going to come into fruition. Like that's just not going to happen. They're not going to put Saquon through that. They're not going to risk like the disarray in the locker room, things of that nature that they feel are very important. They don't want to mess with. So I think there is a chance that they do just let him walk if he doesn't agree to something close. To, I mean, I think they're trying to get something in the middle. Like the Giants want to pay him 12. I think he wants 16 per year. If he can agree on like 14, I think the Giants might actually just sign him. I, you know, I've made it. If they sign Barkley, whatever. There's still, to me, there's yeah. still the one side of it. Like he's a playmaker. He's still one of our best skill position players. We don't have much explosiveness anyway. We're keeping him. Let's pray he stays healthy. Let's pray it's a short-term deal. Let's pray they don't backload the contract. 
but I just wouldn't build a roster like this. And that's why it's, it's not like I don't want to resign sign on Barkley. I don't want to resign any running back ever to a second deal is basically where I'm at with this. There's no running back that I, you, then you say, Oh, but look at all the success McCaffrey has had with the 49ers. Well, one, the Panthers were better after they traded McCaffrey. So how do you explain that Two, Maybe the Niners are just good. Even if they didn't have McCaffrey, you can't really say if they were or weren't. And three, McCaffrey is not like any of these other running backs. You can line him up in the slot like they do and play positionless football with him because he can win in these one-on-one -on -one routes against linebackers, which Barkley's not that great at or hasn't at least shown it so far. No running back really outside of him and like the McKinnon types of the world are doing that. So to me, I just never would really want to spend my cap space on a running back second contract. So that's where I land with Barkley. But at least with Barkley, if they do resign him, he's still adding explosiveness to an offense that doesn't really have it right now outside of maybe Wondell Robinson if he comes back. So exactly. And one one other note that I think is important, and we brought this up, I think, on like two or three shows. Remember, Saquon Barkley has the same representatives as Andrew Thomas. Yeah. So I don't think the Giants are going to be disrespectful, nor would I expect that to happen, even if they didn't. But I just think it's an interesting little note as we enter this free agent period. Okay, Bill Shannon says, we're going to tag Daniel Jones, draft Hendon Hooker, McIntosh, Flowers, Mims, Titman, seal, seal, and call it a day. Yeah, you have your draft plan, I guess, already formulated, Bill. Uh, we're not there yet, Nick and I. We're in the very <laughs> early stages of evaluating prospects. So Love how there was no question there. It was just, this is what we're doing, yeah. and then just boom, done. That's love what it. he wants, and that's a perfect plan for Bill. Maybe it will be a good plan for the Giants. I don't know yet. But um, Lyrical Cynical asks, would you be open – to extending Leonard Williams in order to lower his cap hit for 2023. If so, do you have a price range you'd be comfortable with? I think it would have to be, uh, it was, obviously it's going to be significantly lower than it is right now. I am open to it. And apparently so is Leonard Williams because he said as much in his, I guess you can call it postseason presser at his locker. He said he's open to a pay cut. I'm more for the pay cut rather than the extension just because yeah he was dinged up this season but is he is he a declining depreciating asset right now i'm not really 100 sure i think if joe shane opted to extend him i would be okay but ideally i think i just wanted to take the pay cut right and then the giants could be done with him maybe after this next season yeah i think i lean toward that too and not even lean i think that's my that's where i'm at i don't i don't want to extend Leonard williams um Look, if you try to extend him rather than the pay cut route that Nick was breaking down, he's not going to go too far off what you paid him the first time, right? It's not like he's going to be like, oh, you're offering me five, six million dollars less a year. Sure. I feel like I'm that much worse of a player. They've set the tone already. The Giants, Dave Gettleman did for what he's quote unquote worth to them. So now you can't just be like, ah, here, how about this? And you're going to take him much less. So that means an extension would include a big contract for him with a lot of dead cap down the line with Dexter Lawrence coming up. I just don't want to allocate that much resources to two interior dents of linemen that we saw this year didn't really make enough of an impact to turn this unit into some amazing unit. The Giants are 27th in defensive DVOA this year. That's not the plan to me to get this team back on top on defense. I would rather allocate that money to corner. I'd rather rather allocate that money to edge if if Ojalari doesn't work out. Um, and we think Thibodeau is going to work out, but I just, it's just not how I'm going to do it. I don't, with, if they didn't have Lawrence, sure, I'm open to it. But with Lawrence on the roster, I'm not open to an extension for, for Leonard. I'm right there with you, bro. Okay. Dom Kagia asks, is Tremaine Edwards even worth it? I know we're desperate at an inside linebacker, but I also know Shane wants to build through the draft. How do the Giants improve it? And also, how do the Giants improve at wide receiver besides just Colin Johnson and Wandell coming back? In terms of the wide receiver, I think you add through the draft, whether that's mm -hmm. day two or you can even take multiple kicks at the can since the Giants have 11 picks. You could spend the late day one and maybe get one of the top wide receivers in the class. But I think that's the primary way. Yeah, sure. You can go out and you can get your Marquez Valdez, Scantlings and players like that. But I don't think that's going to make a, a true difference. I think right. you can find guys like Richie James and players that the Giants already had on their roster via free agency. But if you want to actually upgrade that position, you need to attack it in the draft, in my opinion. But in terms of Tremaine Edmonds, look, it's going to depend on the on the contract, and that could be a record-setting type of contract for a young player like Tremaine Edmonds. I don't know if that would be worth it. I'm open to Tremaine Edmonds because I think the Giants need to upgrade that specific position. Now, I haven't done extensive research into the linebacker position coming out of the draft, but regardless of that, we know we need an upgrade, and we don't want Joe Shane to go into, go into the draft saying, I need to draft a linebacker. Right. I need to do it in the first couple of picks. No one wants that type of situation, but I feel like you can have a cheaper option with a TJ Edwards or a player like that. Kaiser White, who I'm not as high right. on, but he's on the Philadelphia Eagles too. So 
I'm open to it, but I think I, I don't know if I would want it to be a record setting linebacker. And as Dan, you talk, I'll pull up the linebacker contracts right now. Yeah, I think I, you know, finish around where Nick is on this one. I don't want to pay Tremaine Edmonds like Kurt, like um, Fred Warner, because I don't think there's really any ceiling. I don't think there's any Fred Warner ceiling for Tremaine Edmonds. And he might ask for that given his age and his trajectory. I think you can get inside linebackers like TJ Edwards and free agency, maybe uh, David Long. You can also do what the Bengals did and reform their their inside backer group through the draft. Some of the players the Bengals have drafted recently, we were high on during our pre-draft process. We really wanted Logan Wilson. We really wanted oh, Keith yeah. Davis Aether. Like These are players who they got on day three of the draft. Linebacker, you can still nail on day three of the draft. We did one last year with McFadden. I would like a different kind of linebacker than a McFadden type, but I understood why they wanted a McFadden type. And by the way, you know who's starting for the Chiefs right now? My boy, Leo Chanel, is playing a lot of snaps for the Chiefs, and he's playing good from what I've heard. So there are players you can get, and they got him at the end of round three. So you can get those types of guys either with like one of our compensatory pick we got from the Chiefs type of range. Um, so linebacker, that's where I want to go. As far as receiver, I think there's one other route. Nick's right. I want to just go through the draft. Free agency is dead, in my opinion, at receiver. Like, it's just completely dead. The contracts are insanely inflated. You have to pay, like, Marquez Valdez scouting. Like, if you want the best one, Christian Kirk, you're paying a stupid price for him. That's not a route I want to go. But the only other route would be the trade route, right? Like, if you yeah. see a really young – and for me, it's only – the young receivers. I have, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I have zero interest in trading for Deandre Hopkins, given his age, injury history, PD usage, no interest in that's an asset you trade for. And you might Kenny Galladay yourself again, but if you can get a young guy like a Brandon Ayuk or a T Higgins, those types of receivers, if for some reason they're available for trade and people just want to reset their rookies contract, take a first round pick, maybe a one and a three. That's the only other route I think they can go. Right there with you. And I want to say one more thing on the linebacker position. So Roquan Smith makes the most money. I don't think Tremaine Edmonds is going to make that much. He makes $20 million per year. He just signed that recently. He's a 26 year old. Yeah, it, it's a lot. Shaq Leonard's second. He makes 19.7. Fred Warner is third at 19. CJ Mosley, remember the Jets signed him in free agency a couple years back, makes 17 million. I, I don't want the Giants to necessarily give that much, but I think that's what it's going to take for Tremaine Edmonds. And I just don't know if that's what Joe Shane wants to do because of all these other young assets on the Giants that the Giants are going to want to retain over the next couple of seasons. So that's kind of where we're at in terms of the linebacker position and in terms of Tremaine Edmonds specifically. Okay, Larry Darling asks, would you rather add a number one receiver or a unicorn tight end thruster? Basically, a George Kittle versus Justin Jefferson. This is so funny too because I just had this conversation with my friend. Shout out Scott Yanofsky, Chris Cody, who it was a funny take, a funny discussion because I said that we had a debate and I said that I would prefer a fully healthy George Kittle over a fully healthy Travis Kelsey. And Chris Cody said that was the dumbest take I ever had. And then I said something that I regret. I was like, if you knew real football, you might not think that. Oh, if you really knew football. It's douche. <laughs> I know. I know. It was such a douchey comment. But his was worse. And his is what sparked the anger by saying, you know, it was the dumbest take you've ever said. Every time somebody tells you it's the dumbest take you ever said, I'm going to get angry. I'm going to react. I'm going to It's going to spark something like that. And I made the point about the blocking, right? Like, that's the difference. Travis Kelsey doesn't block. George Kelsey, uh, George Kittle is like having a, th they literally say it's like having another offensive tackle out there. And then he also does stuff as the receiver. So to me, that's the much better player. But as far as then we got into the whole conversation, because Scott was like, okay, fine, whatever. Would you take Justin Jefferson or George Kittle if you needed him right now today? And then he was like, would you take Justin Jefferson or who's the best left tackle? I said, Trent Williams. You take Justin Jefferson or Trent Williams. So then it got into the whole blocking versus playmaking thing. And I think in the end, he made some great points. And so that, is going to lead me to my next answer, which is going to be Justin Jefferson here. Damn it, man. I thought we were going to differ. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I think, Justin Jefferson, and that's no knock on having a dual threat tight end. I just think having Justin Jefferson does not just create the explosive opportunities for your offense, but it really puts the fear of God yeah. in the defense. Now, George Kittle does too because of his ability to block, and then you can get really creative with your 12 personnel packages, and you can just do a lot of really nifty things. So I really appreciate that. But you're talking about a top, three wide receiver in the entire NFL and every defensive coordinator is going to go into their game plan being like, we got to stop 18, just like Wink right. Martindale did. And when you have 26 back there, if you still have Saquon Barkley, that frees up, I would say room for him and also frees up room for Daniel Jones to run. It just does a lot of great things for you. So right now in this current NFL, I think I'm definitely going to go with Justin Jefferson. Yeah. And that's my main reason for it as well. It just changes how the defenses can scheme to defend you. 
Okay, Satoshi Guacamoto loves Satoshi. What are the must-have Super Bowl foods that every host should have on the menu? Or are there no sacred cows when it comes to Super Bowl food expectations? <laughs> I like the second part. There's no sacred cows when it comes to Super Bowl food. Yeah, I think every host should do it do it the way they want to. But there are a couple things. You need you need chips and dip of some kind. Mm. That could be any kind. I mean, I, for the Super Bowl party I go to every year, shout out Yanofsky. It's the Yanofsky household Super Party. Uh, I go, I bring, I make, I have a really, one of my good things I can do is I, I make a good, really good guac. I have some interesting things I do with it that make the people have said it's amazing. So I make guac. You got to have you, some kind of dip, guac and chips, whatever it is. You know, there's like a French onion dip people make or seven layer dip, whatever you make. Got to have a dip. I think wings are great for Super Bowl parties. They're just excellent thing to have. Um, nachos, nachos, dip, that's along the dip, dip and chips kind of line. So yeah, I would say those are some of my three things I would put on. Yeah, you have to have carrots and celery. Like it's a must have carrots, celery, and hummus. At a full right. of Super Bowl party, that is yeah, definitely no. the case. No, no, we actually go all out. We have a good time. Obviously, alcohol has to be there, but you have to have like pigs in the blanket, I feel like is excellent. Any kind of finger foods, your favorite types of finger foods. And then if you want like a, something prime, pizza always does a, a pretty solid trick. Now, I don't typically, depending on where you but, live in the country. Yeah, yeah. Arizona, you know what? Actually, so somebody brought pizza to my house for one of the parties. I think we watched the Jacksonville Chargers game and they brought over pizza. I had a bite of Diana's pizza. It wasn't that bad. It okay. wasn't that bad. And that's out here in Arizona. And supposedly it's a really reputable place out here. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Because other pizza out here, I've heard, is, is, is pretty horrible out here yeah. in the desert. I would imagine. Uh, I would imagine. James Spadafora asked, I know I'm probably too late, but any chance of trading Tyrod Taylor? I know it sounds weird, but could be a great way to get most of his contract off the books and free up about four mil. Yeah, I don't think there is any chance of the Giants trading Tyrod Taylor. I, um, I also would suggest that they do not do this just to clear cap space. I think a backup quarter, I, I made this case like the last few off seasons and I made it during the season last year when they had to turn to Glennon and Fromm. A backup quarterback to me is an important position. I've always basically my point, my, my case on it is why are we taking the most important position by far in football quarterback and saying we just need one guy there or we don't need any talent there? Why? I would want to add as much talent as possible to the quarterback room at all times. So I like Tyrod as a backup. I know some Giants fans think he's trash. I don't know where that's what that's really based on. He basically never got to play in Brian Dable's system. He played like a quarter and actually moved the ball pretty decently. Um, then played a little bit down the stretch in that garbage time game, moved the ball pretty decently. So I don't know. I don't think it's, I, I wouldn't trade Tyrod. I wouldn't trade Tyrod either, but I will say this. I think Davis Webb could be a quarterback too. Yeah. So I think that's I mean, what makes it interesting. Yeah, I also don't know the market cheap. for Tyrod. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. get him for cheap. He's essentially, everyone says he's like a coach who's a player, sure. knows the system yeah. really well. So I think that's um, one thing that I, that I find to be somewhat interesting is that Davis Webb, to me, is a much better asset than, say, a Mike Glennon or a Jake Fromm. Yeah, that's fair. Matt Blunt asks, what changes to the coaching staff would you like to see, if any, or would you expect to see the same, assuming Kafka and Wink stay in their current roles? Me personally, Dan, I want to see this coaching staff completely the same. I think this is one of the best coaching staffs we've seen in quite a while. There's not one position group that I'm like, oh, we need to change that. Because even the linebackers, man, I think that's much more of a talent issue yeah. rather than a coaching issue. So. For me, I would love for this to stay the same. I don't think it's going to. I think Wink Martindale will be back. I kind of think Mike Kafka is going to be a head coach, but we'll have to wait and see. That's interesting. I'm not still not sure if he'll take the job or not, uh, where that's going. But I would say Nick pretty, pretty much nailed it. Like on the surface, you would think, oh, it's got to be linebacker, right? Look how bad our linebacker play was. But again, that's more just the issue of these players, in my opinion. The only thing I would say is offensive line coach Bobby Johnson. Like if there was some way somehow to dig out one of these retired offensive line oh, yeah. coach gurus and give them like the max money to like make them the highest paid offensive line coach again remember when you pay these coaches it doesn't go against the salary cap it's just the owner's money which we don't care about no offense john marin and you don't care about it either you're worth a billion dollars it gives it gives a crap about a few million here and there not against the cap so if there is a chance to woo one of these elite offensive line coaches out of retirement or out of the job they're currently in by giving them a lot of money that's the that's the area i would look to do it now we have an interesting question about the quarterback position from Sue Merrick. She asks, what other quarterback options do the Giants realistically have if it's not Daniel Jones? We pick 25th, and Tyrod is not a quarterback one. Don't have capital to trade for one, so throw the bag at DJ, right? I don't necessarily think it's throw the bag at DJ, but I agree with the sentiment that 
I think Daniel Jones is easily your best option at quarterback right now, given where the Giants are picking and the place that the Giants are in and how Daniel Jones played in his first year in Brian Dable's system. Yeah, I think this question, Sue, this is a great question because I think it really outlines where the biggest divide is with Giants fans when it comes to the quarterback position, Daniel Jones specifically. And there are a lot of us in the middle. It sounds like you're one of them. And so is Nick and I. We're somewhere in the middle. But where the reason why there are so many people on opposite polar ends, in my opinion, of the Daniel Jones discussion is the difference in how people view Daniel Jones. To answer your question, the Giants do not have any realistic options to be better than Daniel Jones in 2023. But this is where the divide breeds because a lot of people aren't just looking at it like we need to, no matter what, find the best option for 2023. A lot of people are looking at it like I want the best option for 2026. How do I get there? I want the best option for the next 10 years. How do I get there? I want the best option for the next five or 15 years. How do I get there? And if you're looking at it from those two different perspectives, it's why so many people come to these hard disagreements where they're bashing each other's heads in with these huge arguments because it's such a divide in how they view the position. A lot of people aren't viewing this as no matter what, we need to get better or stay the same for 2023 because doing so doesn't guarantee that you're going to be better for 2027. And some people would argue, and they have a decent case, actually a pretty good case, and it's not with this specific example because I think Daniel Jones can still get better as a prospect and a player. But in some examples, by trying to do your best, to, to make things better for the next very next season or the same for the very next season, you're actually mortgaging your future and making things worse for your future. And this to me is where the whole Daniel Jones divides is. For me personally, I'm not super focused on making sure we're better for 2023. I'm way more interested in making sure we're better down the line for the next five or 10 years. I'm still willing to re-sign Daniel Jones because I think he could be the future quarterback, not because I think he's the best option for 2023. That's not my focus. It never will be until we have, until we're locked in at quarterback and we're you know competing for Super Bowls every year like the Bengals and the Chiefs, the, the obvious Super Bowl contenders right now. So until we get to that point, I am always going to be thinking about down the line over the very next season. Right there with you. Then we have a really interesting question from Travis D'Alessandro asks, you're Joe Shane. How are you attacking this offseason? I am attacking it, Travis, like I think Joe Shane will based, not only his pre- based on not only his presser, at the end of the season, but also based on the podcast I listened to with uh, Carl Banks and Bob Papa recently. It was like two podcasts ago by them, or maybe it was their most recent one, where Bob Papa was like, yeah, I was spending some time in the Giants cafeteria after Joe Shane's presser, and I was talking to him, and Joe Shane's like, look, I know what the outside is saying, but this is still something you got to build through the draft. It's still going to be all about the draft. And that's how Joe Shane's going to do this thing. He's not going to go crazy in free agency. He's going to attack this offseason like a smart GM would. Use free agency as a supplement to your roster. Never use it as a lifeblood the way Dave Gettleman did. Never do that because only the bad teams end up doing that. It can work sometimes. There are some examples in history. When Ernie Accorsi had his free agent class of Antonio Pierce, Plaxico Burris, and Kareem McKenzie, that became the lifeblood of the 2007 Super Bowl roster and the 2008 roster that was the best in the NFL at 11-1 and before the Plaxico injury. It worked that one time. When they tried it again in 2016, with Olivier Vernon, who's not even in the NFL, NFL anymore, I believe. Is Vernon playing in the NFL these days? I don't think he's on the Browns anymore. And if he That's was, he'd been injured. What happened to him? That is crazy that he's like not in the he, NFL. He's had a lot of injuries. I'm going to look that up, though. That is weird. I was just thinking that just popped in my head. Like, did Olivier Vernon have the NFL? That's crazy that it's gone from that to that. He's a free NFL, agent. But... Yeah. He's a free wow, agent. He didn't right even play in the NFL. It's insane. He's not even that old. But, um, Vernon, Snacks, and Janoris Jenkins. I don't think any of them are in the NFL anymore. Janoris played. No, nah, Jack Rabbit is. He Jack Rabbit. Something. What do you play? Tennessee? No, Jack Rabbit's on a playoff team, I think. Oh, is he? Yeah. He's like yeah. one of their back end depth pieces. Um, I could look it up real quick, but oh, I, no, I saw no, him no, out no. there and I was like, oh, wow, look, Jack Rabbit's still playing. Yeah, wow. I guess they just pulled him back. But that class obviously didn't work. And there's been so many throughout history. The Washington football team are like the, you know, the poster boys for this. So I expect them to attack it by not attacking it by, you know, building through the draft. And I know it's going to frustrate a lot of Giants fans, but and maybe he'll find something like a little bit of an upgraded Mark Lewinsky type signing because he has a little bit more space to work with. But in the end, they don't have that much space to work with. If you're going to pay Daniel Jones 35, 40 million a year, Saquon Barkley, 14, 15 million a year. And you also got the Thomas and the Dex contracts. I mean, you really just don't have much cap space. The 49ers is where Jack Rabbit is. OK, moment. yeah. Interesting. And the free agency also works when you when you sign someone like Entrell Roll 
if we remember in somewhat recent history, but that right. wasn't a huge spending spree either. If, if I'm not mistaken, that was like one big free agency he came in there and was one of the leaders of the giants defense at a pivotal point in their franchise history. But in terms of the, the plan, look, you re-signed Daniel Jones. I'm hoping it's somewhat of a Jared Goff type contract, like 33 ish around there. I think it might be a little bit more, which I'm not really thrilled with, but I think the giants have to have a contingency in place to where they can get at that. So it's like, yeah, Daniel Jones, we're putting our trust in you, but you need to keep proving to us that you're going to develop. I don't want a huge long-term deal with Daniel right. Jones, and I don't think that's unreasonable to say. Saquon Barkley, I think you set a number there, maybe 13 mil, somewhere around there. If he wants that 16, if he wants to match Saquon or Christian McCaffrey, I think he can walk. And then I'm right there with you. You supplement through free agency, and then you build through the draft. And you can bring in a lot of veterans that you trust, that you know, to help reshape the roster in the manner that you want. But I don't know if you make that big free agent splash. I think a couple names we've gone over, the Tremaine Edmonds, I think they'll be in the conversation. Ultimately, I'm not really certain if Shane's going to go in that direction. But I'm all about, we've always been about on this podcast, building through the draft. And everything Joe Shane has said, everything that Joe Shane has done, has kind of substantiated that. And that gives yes. me a lot of optimism about Joe Shane moving forward. So that's where I'm at. But you was two huge question marks are, are Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones. And then you have the Julian Love conversation. I'll entertain it. But if he's getting, you know, 14 or something like ridiculous, like I'm not going to entertain that. It depends on what kind of deal we're talking about for Julian Love. And, and the issue and, with the Julian Love thing also is like if you start to look at this thing down the line, it's like, are they going to really give a contract to Julian Love and McKinney? Right. Exactly. Now we're talking about allocating 30 million or something to the safety position. And those are your two guys, in my opinion, are not that's not an elite safety group by any means. Those are your two guys. It's why I struggle with the Julian Love thing. I think I lean toward just letting him go. And the reason I brought 14 was because that's what Marcus Williams signed to the Ravens. Okay. I think Marcus Williams is a, a different type of prospect than a Julian Love. I think Julian Love is valuable, right? I think he can do everything well. I think he's good at everything. He might not be excellent at anything other than maybe his intelligence. I think having him out there with this defense that likes to use sub packages because he can fit the run as that apex defender, you know, they, they like to roll nickel against 12 personnel. I feel like he is a, a plus in that standpoint, maybe not to the level of a Jabril Peppers or Landon Collins, mm -hmm. but maybe you could say he is better in coverage than those guys. I think it's fair, even though this season there were a couple coverage laps. So if you're talking about 14 million, I don't want to entertain that, but that could be the market for him. And that maybe one reason why he ends up walking. And again, the New York state tax is absolutely ridiculous. That has to be factored in. You got a Florida True. team or Texas team or the Titans or the Raiders coming in where they have no state tax and they offer him 14 mil. He doesn't have to pay state tax on all that money. Like that is a substantial amount more money that he's going to earn. So that has to right. be factored in in terms of the player standpoint. So I think Julian Love is another interesting conversation, but uh 14 mil is a lot. Yeah. Okay, Darren Manny asks, how many or Howie Roseman's pick of Jalen Hurts in 2020 was pretty controversial at the time, but looks pretty brilliant now. Would you be okay with the Giants drafting quarterback, saying Anthony Richardson type, with a high pick, even if they re-signed Daniel Jones? Absolutely. Yeah, I would 100% support that, but there's no way that Anthony Richardson is falling to 25, in my opinion. At least not at this point. Not only 25, I mean, they got Jalen Hurts in the second round, so that's it. there's yeah. no probably no chance he's falling to them. I think it was like the mid or the late second round. They did. Yeah. yeah. Remember Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts has such a unique past. I mean, he got supplanted. He got usurped by Tua Tagovailoa in a national championship game, had to transfer to Oklahoma where he developed more as a passer. And then he mm -hmm. came out and, and people were like, ah, oh, yeah, he can't throw the football. Well, he just kept developing and kept developing. And that's kind of what we hope Daniel Jones does, right? With stable environment around him, he keeps developing and he keeps developing. But I don't know if there's a, a prospect that's going to be available at 25 for the Giants to draft if Richardson's not around. And I just someone with as many tools as Anthony Richardson, and I can't wait for the draft, bro. I really can't. But somebody with as many tools as Anthony Richardson, there's like no way in this modern NFL where, where, where teams are just putting so much emphasis on tools and size and speed. And the kid's smart too. I don't know if that guy's going to fall into out of the top 20, right? Yeah, I mean, we'll see. You never know. We, I didn't think Malik Fall yeah. Willis was going to fall to like the third round last year, but Malik Willis is such a different prospect too because he's so short Small. and he had so yeah. many issues with the blitz, like with dealing with pressure, like coming right at him. These are different things, and he played quarterback longer than Anthony Richardson, who just started playing the position. Really, as far as like just the hypothetical of it, not going into any names, like an Anthony Richardson. He says the Anthony Richardson type. In that, you know, I personally. And this is something Nick said, of course, too. And I also say, of course, too, your original question. 
But I think most Giants content creators and fans would would say the opposite. They believe once you have one quarterback, don't you dare draft another one over him. Don't you dare put the competition in that room. It's not something Nick and I subscribe to at all. Based on your answer, I can say that confidently, Nick, because you were pretty, you know, defer, uh, definitive in that. But I'm a believer in draft talent to the quarterback position if you need. Like, there's you never should feel set at quarterback unless you have the obvious ones. If you have Mahomes right now and Burrow right now, you should feel set for a reason. If you think that Daniel Jones is that guy, he just needs receivers and offensive line, then you shouldn't draft a quarterback. So if the Giants feel like Daniel Jones will be an elite, uh, the next Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow or Josh Allen, if they can get him a Stephon Diggs or something like that, then no, you should not draft a quarterback because then you're wasting assets. But if they don't feel like that, and they do decide to draft a quarterback, it probably means they don't feel like that, then I'm perfectly fine with it. Because like you said, it worked out really well for the Eagles in their situation. And if you go back to that too, Carson Wentz did not have the locker room. Like Carson Wentz, for whatever reason, yeah. I don't think his personality is abrasive, but it's not necessarily one that invites a lot of people to respect him. At least that's what it says. Now, I'm not in the locker room, so maybe I can't make that declaration, but just from things I've heard from people around the NFL, Carson Wentz doesn't always have the best the best of friends in the locker room. Whereas Jalen hurts came in and that kid just like galvanized the locker room. Everyone followed him. And I feel like that was a huge, important thing. Daniel Jones doesn't necessarily have that issue. Everyone loves Daniel right. Jones. Everyone wants to play for Daniel Jones and everyone respects Daniel Jones. And I think that will be factored in. But at the end of the day, I think what Dan said is accurate. If you don't believe Daniel Jones can be a Pat Mahomes, you have to keep trying to take the kick at the can to find that guy. Yep. Okay. Austin Wang Bailey asks, Hey guys, first time, long time listener. If the Giants don't re-sign Barkley, do you think they would go for one of the available free agents, i.e. Tony Pollard, Kareem Hunt, Miles Sanders, or do you think J Joe Shane would try to draft someone? I love the show. Keep up the great work. I think it'll be a day three, maybe day two, if there's a Kenneth Walker type of prospect who falls into day two that you're absolutely in love with, a Brees Hall, something like that, right? So I'm going to go with uh, more so pursuing it through the draft, getting him on that cheap contract for uh, four years at least. Yeah, I'll be honest, Austin. I'd be pretty devastated if the Giants let Barkley go and then spend free agent dollars and salary cap space on a running back. To me, if they let Saquon Barkley go, it's a good sign that Joe Shane is following the blueprint that I would personally follow for my running back position, which is draft them, keep drafting them, play it, let them play out their rookie contract, then recycle and do that whole thing all over again while building your offensive line and understanding that the best way to run the football is by building a great offensive line and having a committee of backs, i.e. what the Eagles have done. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not open to trying to to, to expending a big time capital pick like an early second like the uh, Seahawks did on Kenneth Walker. I'm still open to that. It's for me, it's all about the financials of it. It's not about as much the, the capital spent on it, but it's also a reason why Nick and I were never in on spending two because two is big time capital. We spent a mid second round pick. There's plenty of busts who were taken in the pick, uh, pick slot that Kenneth Walker were taken over the years. Despite it being such a high pick early mid second round, so many players have busted from that spot. So few players have so many fewer players, I should say, not so few, but so many fewer players have busted from the number two spot, especially non quarterbacks from the number two spot. There's so many fewer busts. So I'm open to it. I just don't want to give the second contract out to the running back. So anyone you would sign a free agency is a second contract running back. I'd rather just run it back with Brita, uh, Brita who you can get for back for cheap, Brightwell, and then another rookie from this draft. Yeah, I think that's the wise thing to do. And I believe that's more than likely what Joe Shane is going to. Um, if they let Barkley go. If they let Barkley go, of yeah. course. Which I think they will resign him. But, but time will tell on that. All right. That's all we have for today on this mailbag. There's still more questions. It seems like a lot of them. So at some point we're going to do a mailbag part three. If your question didn't get answered on one or two, it will be answered on three. But until then, have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you soon.